What is wrong with this house? <laughs> I'm what's wrong with this house. Hey, yo man, so I uh... uh... Oh shit, you're betraying us! Oh, oh. No, oh, no, no! Oh no! No, 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 During Halloween since 2003, board gamers think of this spooky, unique to have game. One part exploring a spooky house, and then there's a reveal, and then it's Halloween styled killing in that spooky house. The problem with this game was uh, this, and then this. The instructions for the second half of the game didn't work a lot of the time. 12 years after the second edition, they did it with the third edition. Avalon Hill, they listened. They fixed, uh, well, Actually, not everything. Okay, so let's just get into it, okay? This 16 to 90 minute game, a mirror trashy for three to six players. Let's go. What exactly is Betrayal, a house on the hill? There is a haunted house somewhere, but it's unexplored. So us characters will take turns slowly revealing rooms in this house, triggering events and getting items or finding special items called omens. Omens are as spooky as they seem. Once you find one, you must make a haunt roll. Now rolling dice equal to the amount of omens flipped. If you get a 4 or below, nothing happens, keep exploring. If you get a 5 plus, the haunt triggers. This revealed scenario is the second half main squeeze of the game, where a certain player is determined to be a traitor aka bad guy, getting a new hidden win condition to defeat the rest of the players, who now work together as a team. These booklets tell you all the new secret stuff, some important backstory, new actions each team can take, and of course each side's special new win condition. In Ameritrash fashion, each player is playing a specific person in America, in a house, each with a certain amount of 4 stats. If any of them drop to a skull, they are dead and out of the game. The number your marker is pointing at is what your character's value is, so you use current speed to move around the map, current might to perform attacks, to roll dice to see how strong that attack is versus other monsters or humans, and exploring a new room doesn't take any dice rolling checks, ends your turn, but lets you trigger a type of card, including letting you grab items. Items that you're just dealing, uh, I mean picking up from rooms, might give you extra traits or actions to do too. And of course, once the haunt starts, both good guys and bad guys will have access to special actions determined by their booklets. But yeah, the game is that simple, you just keep passing off turns like this until one side achieves their hidden agenda. Could be kill everyone else, kill one specific person, exorcise some demon, escape the house, you get the idea, supernatural voodoo stuff. All that secret agenda stuff, it's in these booklets for your specific haunt. You get that, you immediately win the game. Now, on to the review. Pros time, and we have to start with what you're betraying each other with, all these components. Third edition looks bright and vivid, with especially the 45 tiles looking facelifted from before, and so much color. Wow, you can really see the detail in each room. Also, character portraits are colored in to really spur your imagination. Their minis have super clear bases and feel secure into going into their mold in the insert. The dice are really cool at this off-white color. I mean seriously though, they are cool. I know they're not made out of human bones. Wait, wait, are they? Look at all these tiles, portraits, and dice in 2nd edition. Not as vivid, more bland. Okay, sure, these minis were pre-painted, but if you're into any sort of mini painting or have seen any other type of mini painted in your life, these are laughable paint jobs. 
As for learning now, the rulebook is super well laid out and very concise, with plenty of symbols, examples, and intuitive organization everywhere. If you're a betrayal veteran, pretty much all you need to know is laid out on a single page to save tons of time. Then if you're more curious, you can jump to any part with an exclamation mark in the rest of the rules. And thank goodness betrayal has player aids now. One for normal heroes, and one for the traitor, and even one for the monster's turns. Really nice how the back of the hero aid has all the haunt specific stuff once you get to that phase of the game. For the betrayal spooky theme, it's pretty much the same as before. Truly Ameritrash, emphasis on the American horror vibe. You're plainly just idiots in a B-movie going into some abandoned house. You got little kids like Jaden Smith, high school athletes like Michelle Obama, or my dad. These are all six player boards with unique stats, and even have some nice little tidbits for roleplaying. Wait a second, wait. How can you be into mysteries and not have any cases solved? No, no, okay, like seriously, what the heck, Jaden? I know you're 11 years old, but still, seriously, either you're one of the worst kid detectives ever, or you're not really that much into mysteries. And in that case, why do you say mysteries is your hobby? What is it gonna be, Jaden? Characters now have backstories in the rulebook, more roleplaying ingredients. It'll even say how some characters know each other to make you really feel like you're in a small American town. And we had to look up the DJ character's favorite music of Dungeon Synth. Hey, this is pretty good. It was a great soundtrack to use while playing. The gameplay at its core is also pretty much the same as Betrayal 2nd Edition. A really unique premise of a game split into two connected halves. One half being pure exploration, and then the second half is... Well, anything kinda can happen with the 50 different haunts. Since haunt bookers are hidden for each side, you'll play the second half haunt by experimenting with different items and locations on the board, trying to guess their opponent's hidden flaws and win conditions, teamwork usually necessary. Oh, and there's going to be all sorts of evil monsters running around too. All throughout the first and second half of the game, any supernatural thing can happen in betrayal as you keep exploring the house. Maybe there will be technical difficulties with an elevator to make you fall to the basement, or you hallucinate random funerals. Or you'll find weird stuff, like strange medicine you shouldn't drink, but uh, but will, or a sick leather jacket to wear. Or just rev up for some fun. <laughs> and betrayal won't always be you hungrily looking over your traitor's tome trying to exploit some evil secret advantage, because the haunts can sometimes be free-for-alls, they can have hidden traitors, or the haunts can even be cooperation missions. For more pros on the betrayal formula, check out our second edition review right there. We're here for 3rd edition, so now we gotta talk about the cool gameplay changes from 2nd ed. Like, they now have a method to help fix the possibility of haunts triggering too early or too late. So now you just cannot get haunts on the first omen because you need to roll a 5 on the special dice to trigger it, and you only roll one die that has a max value of 2. You also can't get it on the second omen because that only lets you roll 2 dice, max value there is 4. If the deck of 9 omens runs out, a haunt immediately triggers, so no more waiting way too long for the haunt to happen. Plus, every time you start a game, you pick one of the 5 scenario cards, which give you an opening hook to why the heck you're in this house. Maybe you're just a team of investigators like Scooby-Doo, or extremely desperate to buy a house. When the haunt is triggered, just flip this over and it'll tell you exactly where to go, super fast, and the haunt will be at least somewhat tied to the initial premise. And my gosh, the haunt booklets function so much better. Like, look at this comparison! Not only is it dividing with separate colors, but it has clear boxes to guide your attention. How to win here, your actions here, your monster right here. So much nicer than before, and doesn't do the weird thing of mixing flavor text and mechanics to get the instructions across. Then abilities have been reworked, like stealing is removed from the game, which was an extremely swingy action to steal another player's item through might rolls. Like, no more stealing someone's crucial item for a haunt and then just getting away with the game. Or how about whenever there is an ability you can do, it has a symbol matching it, making it really easy to reference. Then there's a nice rule that if you do a secret action in one of these booklets, you must read the action out loud, which really helps stifle those sleazy players in 2nd edition that just did actions and then never explained why they were doing it, and you just had to take their sleazy word for it and couldn't really prove whether or not they were cheating until after the game when you saw the booklets. And the heroes can't game monster movement as much, with the fantastic change that monsters can just move from the basement landing to the ground landing and vice versa. Wait, why is this so good? Well, players are the only ones that can use special rooms to yeet out of the basement, and there's only two other rooms that will let you walk from the basement normally. In 2nd edition, it wasn't too uncommon to see monsters getting trapped in the basement and being useless. 
Also, the tiles are now streamlined for just smoother play. Like, once you explore this tile, you just get its buff. That's it, no frills, no nonsense. The equivalent in 2nd edition was a super fiddly system of marking it for your specific player, yuck for components. Or how about the junk room that will just straight up spawn an obstacle that has its own text on it, instead of 2nd ed having you to make a roll every time you wanted to leave. Basically, all this streamlining makes Betrayal run shorter in a healthy way, much closer to the 60 to 90 minutes printed on the box. But it is Betrayal at House on the Hill, and anything can happen, and so that sounds like we should start getting to the cons. So now it's cons. We talked about how they streamlined and cleaned up their approach to the new 50 haunts here, but the fact of the matter is that they're still pretty unclear at times. Like, there's this way of phrasing setup which is for variable player count, but newcomers aren't going to know this unless this guide is plastered on each haunt. Or how when you're supposed to read things aloud, it needs to tell you exactly what to say or not say, since if you read the entire action sometimes, you just spoil your win condition. Or how about just poor wording, like let's talk about this monster description. Doesn't take damage from attacking humans. It's meant to say that the monster doesn't take damage when it itself fails to attack humans, but it could totally be interpreted as it doesn't take damage when humans attack it. It sounds so strong when you interpret it as being basically invincible to attacks. Stuff like this needs to be rewarded or have an additional line of text. Betrayal needs to hide information successfully in these booklets, especially the Traitor's Tome. And the moment players have confusion during game and start showing these booklets to one another to clear up the confusion, the haunts start getting kind of creaky, and it's purely up to the players to hide information when they show it to each other, which is just kind of janky, okay? There's much less of this confusion now compared to 2nd edition, but it's still here. Then the cardboard bits feel very Hasbro-y still. Small monsters are hopelessly generic, bigger monsters aren't much better, and text is hard to see. And the insert just wants you to put all the small tokens into one pile, which is, well, disgusting for organization. More text is hard to read, like on tiles for special abilities, or hero traits for green numbers, because chances are, you're not going to be playing under studio lights, so it'll look more like this during gameplay. Some doors are also hard to see, because they blend in with the current orangey direction of many rooms, which wasn't a problem with the more unsaturated rooms in 2nd edition. Like, look at this mystic elevator. One is prettier, but the other is just easier to distinguish what's going on in general. And the notches on the new player boards are a good idea, but they don't actually work that well to separate numbers. And we're worried that these will cause more wear on the rather thin player boards over time. Speaking of text, the player aids also aren't perfect. Where it really needs to stress a new rule, when you explore something, it immediately ends your turn. And then the tiles. Man, they are thin. We haven't had this game for long, and they're already sticking up so you have to stack them all up perfectly to not have this springy effect. What's the worst is that the tiles stick up on the table by themselves. Oh no, tiles going under each other during gameplay. We got two nitpicks. First, we gotta talk about the omens. So now there's only nine omens of the game, as opposed to base games 13, so four less. On a basic level, yes, this adds more consistency to the game. The less omens that have weird abilities you have in the game, the less weird board states you'll have that can mess up haunts. But with only nine omens in the game, You'll frequently draw through most, if not all, of this entire omen deck every game, putting a damper on repeat value. Also, if omens have simpler abilities compared to 2nd edition, then that means there's a damper on haunt death? Because if they're streamlining the omens, they're streamlining the haunts, right? Well, we've only played two haunts, but I went ahead and massively spoiled the heck out of myself by reading both through the good and bad guy books for a handful of scenarios. Don't recommend doing this ever. Anyways, the scenarios I've read seem fine at a glance. I mean, they still have the whole superstition, serial killer, exorcism, killer robot sort of thing from Betrayal 2nd Edition. While your mileage may vary based off of your group, some of them just seem a little too streamlined, too simple. This is especially for the co-op scenarios, because now there's just less nuanced abilities and abilities overall for your group to puzzle over. See, you have an Ameritrash gameplay loop that's now simpler with less stuff, that still gets enhanced by the secrecy of hidden win conditions. But take out those hidden win conditions for co-op haunts and to a lesser degree free-for-all haunts, and you lose even more from gameplay in Betrayal 3rd Edition. One co-op haunt I found has you just working together to clean a house. Like, it looks like this technically works with some new mechanics, but is that really what you want to go to a spooky house for? The last nitpick is, yep, the haunts still have room for imbalance. That's just gonna happen in a simple game with emergent win conditions, where sometimes a trader just happens to be loaded with the best items. Or sometimes the specific locations you need for your win condition are all on the bottom of the tile deck. 
Like to fix these things, you could use an app or make the haunt selection more complicated than just this or make the haunt setups more intricate. But these things require you to pretty much revamp the game and make it way more wordy, which goes against what Betrayal is though. Like this is supposed to be a simple yet thematic fun romp through a haunted house that doesn't pride itself on nuance, so we can't really fault it much here. And the rulebook even admits to that. Also, it was all too uncommon to house rule in 2nd edition that your group could pick a new trader for whatever reason, like for uncomfortable traders or balance, and now there's proper rules for that. Though, uh, trader strength and haunt balance isn't always so clear when the haunt triggers. Ah, whatever, okay, let's just move on, okay? Now it's time for the recommender score, where we try to critically evaluate the aforementioned pros and cons, and also with the caveat of, is this even a good idea in the first place? For some reference, we gave Betrayal 2nd Edition a 7 out of 10. A really cool idea that promised a very thematic night, but a very unpredictable and janky one at that, where the game could fall apart in the haunt. But then again, it wasn't even meant to be taken too seriously anyways. Now, Betrayal 3rd Edition is going to get a 7 out of 10 from us. It's good. It's clearly better than 2nd edition, but not good enough to be elevated to an 8 out of 10. There's way more clarity and quality of life stuff for pretty much the same gameplay, but 3rd edition didn't solve everything while also going really hard on the streamlining. You gotta think about why you're playing Betrayal in the first place. Oh, <laughs> You're playing for a super thematic night. But then 3rd edition has simpler cards, simpler abilities, and simpler haunts. So that 2nd edition players might be surprised on the less spookiness, less vibing. But then this trade-off is totally worth it for most players, a game that's easier to start and also play with haunts that consistently work. They just don't need as much self-correction and are way more readable. Like, it's going to be way less intimidating to give a newcomer this haunt booklet for traders, which is one of the biggest barriers of 2nd edition. Like, straight up, the amount of times we had to stop playing 2nd edition because of some rule argument or jank was just, ah, this is terrible, and we're probably not alone there. Like you gotta admit, in 2nd edition you were playing to half make up your own game, or expect to restart if you got a shoddy haunt. Now that's way less likely to happen, so the mechanical parts of Betrayal now work better, with perhaps a little less charm. Like, yeah, the gallery is no longer a decision to fall to the ballroom and take damage, but is now leads to ballroom. Or how the spooky crypt that causes you damage is just gone from the game now. Or how the old revolver with all these abilities on it is just now a gun, which is less complicated and less strong, which helps, yep, balance and streamlining with the game. Like, prime example of this is the dark dice, which got completely axed. This could pretty much just put you into near dying after using it once, but led to bombastic outcomes in haunts with the right rolls. Or if you've played the expansion Widow's Walk, gone are using dumbwaiters which are shortcuts to landings, or super nuanced locations like the solarium and laundry room. Rooms in 3rd edition can feel pretty vanilla and samey on their own sometimes, which is par for the course of streamlining. But I mean, the mystic elevator is still here, there's still fun weapons, there's 50 new haunts, and the gears of everything actually turn without putting on your game designer cap mid-game. Today, if you were to get 2nd edition, you're probably the type to get Widow's Walk as well. This means you want pretty wide ranges of outcome, are pretty chill on rule clarity, really like the flavor text and nuanced items here, and maybe, maybe even enjoys the, let's face it, Kelvin balling of rules mid-game. So for the vast majority of people, if this pseudo party game looks like it appeals to you, get 3rd edition. Betrayal 3rd Edition is the same campy, spooky, and merry trashy gameplay, with a little less magic, with a lot more coherent haunts to easily get into for an unpredictable night in. Basically, if you didn't like it before, it's still not going to be your type of game. But if you did like it before, now it's just way more of an actual game. Oh, and then warning, this Widow's Walk expansion is not compatible with 3rd Edition. You have been warned, because we have seen these sitting in shelves in stores. We wouldn't want someone to get betrayed by their purchase there. My personal score for Betrayal 3rd Edition is going to be a 6 out of 10. I have an above average time with it. Let me tell you a story about this Betrayal at House on the Hill. One of the first real modern board games I've ever played. I immediately loved the spooky vibe it was going for, and the fact that halfway throughout the game anything could happen was super awesome with hidden victory conditions and some versus all teamwork, mechanics that immediately gripped me and still do today. With the Widow's Walk expansion, 2nd edition was a game that served me well throughout my high school and college years, 
where it was the go-to game for many nights, due to how simple it was and how many stories it gave. But of course, second edition fans know that the haunts could totally go off the rails, and so it was a gamble for betrayal. Would the game be amazing and fire on all cylinders, or would it be an utter train wreck that we tried to house rule for, stopping the game hard during a playthrough to have a game designing session? And so when playing 3rd edition, the haunt jakiness is technically mostly solved. But then, this didn't have the same magic as 2nd edition. Why? Well, I would sum it up on how 3rd edition is a little too safe, or perhaps too short for what I'm looking for in a spooky night in. I was really surprised on how empty 3rd edition feels compared to before. Like seriously, I miss people gambling on dark dice every turn, drinking black goo from a vial, the chance that an item does get stolen. Items felt more like items with multiple lines of text before, but I know that these are all things that make the haunts pretty much impossible to balance. Or I miss the weird high that I get from a haunt triggering on Omen 2 and the game still being somewhat balanced. Like I really miss the gameplay option to run around and manipulate all the rooms from when we played with Widow's Walk 2. Again, probably a little too complicated for newcomers and mess with some haunts, but man, I loved making the decision to end my turn at the gym to get jacked, or being scared about moving out of the attic, or going to the laundry to dumpster dive through the item deck was my favorite. So that's the huge betrayal problem for me. I really like second edition's wild swings of occurrences, but even me being chill with the outcomes got tilted when we had to hotfix the game repeatedly during haunts. But then 3rd edition, while it functions better, removed a lot of the magic of why I'm playing Betrayal in the first place. It's a lot less flavorful, it's a lot less crazy. Plus, in my place, and during my massive spoiling of myself of the haunts, 3rd edition just didn't seem as scary. Haunts just feel more abstract, or just supposed to be evil, instead of really getting into the nitty gritty about poltergeist, undead rituals, Frankenstein. Basically, 2nd edition haunts just vibe harder to me, with more flavor text and darker themes. 3rd edition still has some of that, some undead stuff, some robots or ghost aliens, yeah sure, but I'm not really feeling the scare. Like, when we're playing, I just straight up forget about this initial scenario, because I'm a little used to 2nd edition not having it, but also, who cares? Like, who cares? It's not gonna have any effect on my exploration anyways. I'm also sick of co-op in Betrayal too. It makes the haunt feel like a turd. Why did Betrayal suddenly become a group project? I don't like co-op games without a mystery, and this isn't even a good co-op game anyways. The story here in this booklet, once you know everything, is not that great. Once you throw away the hidden info, players versus players conflict, there's not really much notable mechanics for me. And then also, why am I not betraying someone else or being betrayed in a game called Betrayal at House on the Hill? Where's the betraying? What the heck co-op? My head knows this is a superior run through than 2nd edition. Now people are saved from the terror of the game dysfunctioning like an old car on the highway. It was like 2nd edition could pick up speed with the vibes, then force your group to pull over to fix it or just completely start over. But on another level, my heart is sad that I won't see the higher highs from 2nd edition again because 3rd edition exists. It's a teensy bit of the Battlestar Galactica unfathomable effect too, streamlining an older game to make it shorter and less janky, but in the process not hitting quite the same highs for me. Anyways, I'm not so stuck in the past to keep 2nd edition over this, and I'm going to be playing a lot more of this at 1 to 1.5 and a half hours with a lot of player interaction, and who knows, maybe my score will raise to a 7 out of 10. Yo guys, so you've probably seen we got a new table. This is, yeah, solid stuff. A geek and a son made this and shipped it to us. Thank you, geek and son, geek and son, for their Megan table. I had a blast setting it up, and I'm really digging it over our old duchess in tons of ways so far. We'll have a full review coming for this table, but if you just can't wait to get this or anything else from Geek & Sin for whatever reason, use our code below at the Geek & Sin website for 5% off. 5% might not sound like a lot initially, but 5% off of actual furniture is not bad. Like this solid good wood. Solid wood. Hey, hey thanks for watching the video on Betrayal. House on the Hill, 3rd edition. Glad I could get this out before Halloween for you guys. And as always, thank you so much to our patrons at patreon.com slash shelfside. All right here, thank you guys so much. I see your names, all your awesome names. They're going over here. It's going, it's going. And then also we got our Mad Lads cardboard over here. Thank you guys so much. And let me know if there's any games you want me to review. Let me know what you think about the streamlining of Betrayal at House on the Hill. I'd like to see what you think. And also, 
yeah, that's it. Subscribe, like, comment. Yeah, that. See ya. Bye-bye. God, Betrayal is such a weird game.